you for manifesting yourself during this study. We thank you for those who have tuned in in order to participate in this study. Thank you for opening the windows of heaven and manifesting yourself according to your riches and glory. Let this study of this particular title for the people of God bring transformation into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We welcome all of you that are joining us online and all of those who later on go to the archives in order to study um, this particular session. Thank you for participating in this study tonight. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be a fabulous, enlightening scripture for you to focus your attention on. Uh, an enlightening uh, revelation concerning who you are in Christ, what your spiritual identity is. God refers to you as his special treasure. Can you imagine that? It's wonderful when a fellow human being says, you're special to me. When they say, out of all the people I'm acquainted with, out of all the people in life I come in contact with, you are special. But what about when the God of heaven, the king of the universe, picks you out of the whole human race, chooses you, and says, not only are you special to me, I treasure you. What a name given to God's people, a special treasure. So we're going to study how deeply God treasures his people and how powerfully he reserves them. He preserves them unto himself. Now, there's a number of related title scriptures, uh, some of which are other translations of the same passages that we'll be studying out of the New King James Version. And uh, some are just slightly varied from the other scriptures with a few unique words. So we put them all together, and I'll just go through the list quickly. God refers to us as a special treasure, his very own people, a people for himself, a special people, his own unique treasure, his treasured possession, a treasure hid in the field, the purchased possession, God's own possession, his own special people, a people claimed by God for his own and God's own people. You ought to lift your hand right now and say, I belong to God. I am his precious treasure and precious possession. Now we have five foundational scriptures and I'm just going to read through those scriptures and then from that launching pad, we'll move into the orbit of this revelation. Exodus 19.5, this is a passage of scripture quoting something that God said right before the revelation of the commandments when he came down in fiery display on Mount Sinai. But just prior to that, he says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And they were a special treasure to him because he was revealing the law that ministered a curse and ministered death because it was a demand on their behavior that they had to live up to in order to maintain a right relationship with God. And there was very little room for mercy, restoration, as it is in the new covenant. And if they were a special treasure to him then, how much more are you a special treasure to him now that the plan of God has moved into a whole new level of relationship with his people? Deuteronomy 7, 6, God said, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure, a special people above all peoples on the face of the earth. And then Deuteronomy 14, 2, because you are a people set apart as holy for Adonai your God, and this is from the complete Jewish Bible, Adonai your God has chosen you to be his own unique treasure out of all peoples on the face of the earth. And then 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, 
that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I can truly say that the light we are walking in is marvelous. It causes me to marvel. Every day of my life, I'm filled with wonder. I'm filled with awe. I marvel over this amazing thing that has been given to us, the gift of righteousness, the gift of eternal life, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of salvation, how gifted and blessed we are. So... We need to show forth or um, proclaim the praises of him who has called us out of darkness. We're no longer children of darkness, walking in darkness under the power of the prince of darkness. We're walking in the light. And then Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14 says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit a promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. It's all to redound to him or rebound toward him as praise. All these wonderful things God is proclaiming about us should return to him as a river of worship. Praise God. In fact, that's the way it works. To the woman at the well, Jesus said, if uh, you're thirsty, uh, then uh, I will give you water to drink of where you'll never thirst again. That water flows into a person from without. But then he said that water will be in you, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And so the river of life flows into you to change its circuit and to flow back to God as a river of worship. Praise God. Now, I do need to mention that uh, quite often in the King James Version, the word peculiar is used in some of the scriptures I just quoted. And I have chosen not to include that because the meaning, the shade of meaning assigned to the word peculiar is different now than it was during the time when it was translated that way in the King James Version. Because Originally, the word translated peculiar, or originally the word peculiar rather, meant a special, treasured, guarded personal possession. Something peculiar was special, treasured, guarded, and personal. It was unique to you. But uh, now the word peculiar means strange, weird, out of the ordinary, uh, uh, usually, or something quite similar to that. And so it's a misapplied word now. To call us God's peculiar people doesn't mean we're strange or out of the ordinary. It means we are a special treasure to him. And so we've chosen the more modern translations. Now, let's go to the Old Testament, Exodus 19.5. As I already mentioned, this is a passage that was given to the children of Israel right before this intense revelation where the fire of God consumed Mount Sinai and God gave the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments that outline moral behavior and religious behavior for those in covenant with God. And he says, now therefore, if you will obey indeed my voice, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now, I want you to notice that when this promise was given and when this spiritual identity was applied to God's people, it hinged on having an obedient spirit. The Bible even said that Jesus, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience through the things which he suffered. And it's all uh, together impressed my heart that if he who was perfect and spotless and sinless and blameless had to learn obedience. If the firstborn son of God, who was God manifested in the flesh, had to learn obedience, how much more do you and I, who are imperfect and blemished, have to learn obedience? It is a hinge on which much of our inheritance turns. And God said, if you obey my voice, which was about to come forth like thunder, and if you keep my covenant then you'll be a special treasure to me. 
And not only that, in the next verse, God said, you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, the word priest means one who has access into the presence of God. Or, in essence, it means to draw near. So God says, I, I, I've called you, I've chosen you out of all the world to be my special people. And if you will respond to that with gratitude and live a life of obedience, then I'm going to give you priesthood rights. And you're going to have access into my glorious presence. And that's when you'll become a holy nation, separated by God from the world unto himself and cleansed and sanctified. Now, of course, the cleansing, the sanctification was uh, insufficient under the old will because it was based on the blood sacrifices of animals. But now we have the precious blood of Jesus, the blood of the Son of God, cleansing us. How much more so are we a special treasure unto God? And how much more so do we all have priesthood rights? Now, originally, God told all of Israel they would be a kingdom of priests. But because of two incidents, uh, primarily the incident at Mount Sinai where they ran to the backside of that desert area and they said, Moses, you talk to God and we'll listen to you, but let not God talk to us or we'll die. They rejected that personal responsibility of following the voice of God. And then later on, when Moses was in the mount, they made a golden idol. And uh, that day, when judgment fell on Israel, the priesthood shifted to the tribe of Levi, the only tribe that stood by Moses when idolatry was rampant in Israel. So because of those two incidents, the priesthood passed from all of Israel just to the tribe of Levi, which means joined. The name Levi means joined to God in a very special relationship. Well, uh, now God has reinstated his original desire, and that was for every person in covenant with him to have priesthood rights into his presence. And of course, now that is so much more powerful because back then only the high priest could actually enter the Holy of Holies where the presence of God dwelt. But now every one of you can come boldly to the throne of grace uh, and know that you are accepted as a priest, accepted as holy unto the Lord and his special treasure. All of these things that God spoke under the old will to Israel are amplified and magnified in the New Testament, the Bible said he came to magnify the law and make it honorable. So we can claim these promises because we've been grafted into Israel, but we've been moved up to a higher level of the fulfillment of these things. Now, one other translation of Exodus 19.5 calls us his very own people. His very own people. That's a way of saying, you belong to me. I am jealous over you. I'm going to reserve you unto myself. I'm going to fight your battles for you. You are my people. You're not just any people. And again, if God could say that to Israel, he certainly says it to those who are a part of the new covenant. The word translated treasure there is segula. And uh, it's also translated jewels. In Malachi chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, which I find very interesting, beautiful passage of Scripture, uh, Malachi says, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. They spoke often one to another, the King James says. And the Lord heard it. The Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day when I make up my jewels, his segula, his jewels, on the day when I make up my very own people, my special treasure, and I will spare him as a man spares his own son who serves him. So you are destined to be jewels in God's crown, jewels in God's hands, jewels that are very special to him. But I think you need to remember that jewels like uh, rubies and sapphires and emeralds are forged in the, in, in the depth of the earth where the, the, the molten uh, lava and the, and the heat is so intense 
and yet that kind of uh, that kind of uh, uh, that kind of scenario produces these gems of great value. And some of you have been through the fire. You've been through what felt like hot molten lava, I'm sure, what you went through. But you were destined to come forth as one of God's jewels. And praise God for that. And uh, another related scripture is Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure, a special people above all peoples on the face of the earth. Now, why did God say that to Israel? The next two verses explain why God said it to Israel. He was searching the world over for a nation that he could destine for supremacy, a nation that would be the head and not the tail, the head socially, the head governmentally, the head theologically, the head spiritually, the head religiously, the head economically. In every way, God said, I will make you the head and not the tail. Well, why did he choose Israel? If I was God and I was seeking to find a nation that could occupy a headship role of dominance in the world, I would probably pick out a nation already recognized as being an empire or already recognized as being dominant in the world. But God intentionally went absolutely the opposite. And here in verses 8 and 9 of the same chapter, God says, The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. That's something I call the mustard seed principle. God loves to take the least and make it the greatest, the lowest and take it to the highest, the last and bring it up to the first. That's just the way God is. He reaches to the bottom to lift to the top. And it proves what a mighty God he is. And God chose Israel to be a special treasure to him, not because they were more in number. They didn't qualify within their own effort or their own status. But they were the least of all peoples. Then God explains this motive. But because the Lord loves you, number one, it's all based on love, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the covenant that he had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was something that he intended to fulfill. He told Abraham in the beginning, your seed are going to be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they shall oppress them 400 years. And afterward, they're going to come out with great substance. So God had to keep that promise. And so he said, because the Lord loves you, because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, even from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And again, it's all about love. It's all about love. I give you two scriptures that you should go to in your Bible. The first one is Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 4 through 8. This is a very graphic uh, explanation of how God found Israel, the conditions they were in spiritually and really uh, physically and materially, enslaved, oppressed, abused. And he describes them as a child, a newly born child that has been just discarded, trashed in the open field. And uh, God said, as for your nativity, on the day you were born, and, and really that could be referring uh, further back than their deliverance from Egypt, and yet it could be referring to uh, being born again as a nation brought out of bondage into following God through the wilderness. But he said, as for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No eye pitied you to do any of these things, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out into the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. And when I passed by you, and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, Live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. And uh, I like the King James Version there. It says, when I passed by you and saw you polluted in your own blood, I said unto you, live. In other words, they were hopeless. They were helpless. There was no way they could survive what had been dealt to them in life. But God gave a command 
to those that seem destined to die. And he said, live. And then in verse 8, he said, when I passed by you and looked upon you, indeed, your time was the time of love. In other words, love caught up with you. Love pursued you. And God said, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you. Wow. And that's something we can claim as new covenant people of God as well. What a fantastic passage of scripture. And then Song of Solomon, chapter 8. It starts out, I think around verse 5, where the, uh, the narrating choir says, Who is this that comes out of the wilderness? leaning upon the arm of her beloved. So it depicts the bride coming out of the wilderness, leaning on the arm of the Messiah, trusting in him, devoted to him, in love with him. And then she says to him, set me as a seal upon your heart and a seal upon your arm. For love is strong as death and jealousy as cruel as the grave. And then verse 7, many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. And so in essence, the bride is saying, love has prevailed. Love has prevailed. And she said, set me as a seal upon your heart. Now a seal was a device that was used to place an imprint on documents, to authenticate, to authorize some kind of transaction that was uh, sometimes on a ring or on a piece of jewelry. It had raised uh, a raised image or an, in, uh, uh, an image down inside the metal uh, in, order to, uh, in order to impart an image to the clay that was used. And uh, anyone who was a businessman had to have a seal. And she's saying to the bridegroom, set me as a seal upon your heart. In other words, wear me in a protected place, just as they would wear these seals or signet rings either on their hand or on a necklace around their neck in order to uh, preserve them, keep them from being stolen. Uh, in like manner, the bride is saying, keep me close to your heart where the enemy can't come and steal me and where I can feel your heartbeat and where I can... Uh, be treasured and preserved by you. Set me as a seal upon your heart. And also it means the bride is saying, use me to imprint this world, to place uh, an imprint of the character of God on the world around me. Use me like a seal, like a signet ring on your hand. Wow, that's uh, an amazing request and I believe a request that God fulfills. Uh, what is a treasure? If you tell someone you're a treasure to me, you're saying you're of great value to me. You're of great worth to me. You are worth so much. I, I hear people all the time in church testify, and they get up and, and whine their way through a testimony, and I understand where they're coming from. But they say, oh, I'm not worthy to stand before you today, or I'm not worthy to sing this song, or I'm not worthy to share this thought out of Scripture. Well, in one sense that's true, because in the flesh, none of us are worthy. But the blood of Jesus Christ has made us supremely worthy, because he has washed us clean to the point where we have become the righteousness of God in Christ. And so I think... We should celebrate our worthiness, not in an egotistical way, because it's not something we did, but something he did for us. We are of great worth to him. We are of great value to him. Deuteronomy 14, 2. Because you are a people set apart as holy, for Adonai, your God, which is a Hebrew word uh, that is substituted for Lord, uh, as Holy for Adonai, your God. Adonai, your God, has chosen you to be his own unique treasure. Unique treasure. His treasure possession out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. Now that's a general corporate statement for all of God's people. And the church, the bride of Christ, is unique. You can't find any other religion like it in the world. You can't find any other theology like it in the world. You have extreme opposite opinions. You've got Islam that teaches such uh, a Unitarian view of God 
that uh, for God to share his divinity with anything or anyone is the highest of sins. It's called shirk. And that's why in that worldview, it's totally unacceptable to say that Jesus was God in a human body. So you have that, and then you have the extreme opposite of Hinduism that says everything is God. The whole universe was emanated out of God, so it's all God, the Godhead veiling itself in the appearance of physical matter. But that makes everything divine, and we are all God. But right in the middle of these two extremes, you have Christianity that says there is one God. However, that one God has three manifestations, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that are relational between themselves, and these three make up one God. You don't find that anywhere. We are a unique people with a unique insight into the character of God. And we are unique in the fact that we're the only people with blood-washed hearts that are free from the judgment and the uncleanness of our past sins. But on an individual level, too, I would dare to say every one of you is a special treasure to God in your uniqueness. You have unique gifts. You have unique abilities. You have unique talents. God knew before you came. Read Psalm 139. The days were ordered for you before you got here. God created the, within you the potential character that you could manifest that is perfectly matched to the gifts that you should bring forth in life. You are unique. And uh, I believe you need to see yourself like God sees you. Amen. We should see our value even more now because the ultimate price has been paid for our redemption. Now, you ought to lift your hand right now and say, I am a unique treasure to God. Now, I want to show you a powerful passage of Scripture. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, Jesus said, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If that's true with respect to men, that's true with respect to God. If your treasure is a car you've been working on for two years and putting all kinds of fancy chrome on it, that's what your heart reverts to. Whenever you have extra time, you work on it. But if you're caught up in an ecstatic love relationship with the God of the universe, that's where your treasure is. Your heart is focused on that. But if it's true with man, it's true with God. If you are his treasure, his heart is focused on you constantly constantly. Now, Jesus gave a parable at the beginning of his ministry. In Matthew chapter 13, we have seven primary parables of the kingdom. Eight, if you add a, a, a final statement at the end. Parables of the kingdom of heaven, or things that help us understand characteristics of the kingdom of heaven, the nature of that kingdom, how it builds itself, how it advances in this world, who participates in it, these parables reveal that. And he said this, again, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, in other words, the domain where the king of heaven rules. It's a spiritual realm. It merges with this realm. It's accessible. It's right here, just like radio waves are in a little bit higher uh, uh, imperceptive realm. We, we can't perceive them. We can't see them with our eyes. Uh, we can hear them within the auditory range of our ears. But if we have the right device to tune into uh, those radio waves, we can pull music right out of the air. But it's right here. It's not far away. And in like manner, the kingdom of heaven is right here. It's not far away. The domain that the king of heaven rules over. And he said the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Now, there's two flip sides to this revelation. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure for you, but this is how the kingdom of heaven functions. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. Now, that could be speaking of the sacrificial uh, attitude of heart that you have in order to repent and give up things in life that you thought were valuable in order 
to take hold of the kingdom of heaven in your life. But on the other hand, it could mean that the king of heaven came down to the field. In another parable in Matthew 13, the field is the world. And God finds a treasure in that field. This world is wicked, it's unclean, it's disappointing, it's disheartening, it's painful. And it could be rejected if that's all that you found in this world. But there's a treasure hidden in this world, and that treasure is the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. And when Jesus uh, discovered within you and all the others that are a part of the body of Christ with you, a yielded heart, he hid you. You became hid with Christ in God, the Bible says, and he paid the price, of course, to secure you unto himself. Now, you need to see that if, if a person, for instance, let me give you an example. If a person goes out to a mall and they've got $100 in their pocket, this man or woman has $100 in his or her pocket, and they've got to buy a suit or a dress, that person has got to make up his or her mind that that item of merchandise is more valuable than the price to be paid, or the exchange will never take place. The item purchased has to become more valuable than the price paid. You talk about an edifying thought. The price paid for you was the precious, precious blood of Jesus. But God considers you more valuable than his own blood. More valuable than his own blood. How awesome is that? He bought the field. He didn't just buy the treasure. He bought the field according to this parable. And so the blood of Jesus was sufficient pur purchase price to buy the world back unto himself. But out of the world, not everything is going to be redeemable or reconcilable. But there's a treasure there that is the bride of Christ. Now, how are we going to respond to these things? How are we going to respond? God should become our treasure. If we are his treasure... It's only right that we reciprocate and that he becomes our treasure. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 says, Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. He is precious. If you become the precious seed of the earth, and that's what the Bible calls you, then you should look heavenward toward the sower and, and declare he is precious to me. If I'm precious to him, he's precious to me. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul writes, We have this treasure, this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the, the power might be of God and not of man. In other words, we have a treasure of a relationship with God. And uh, he treasures us. We treasure him, this internal presence, this internal union where our spirits and his spirit have blended and become one. But we're still in earthen vessels so that we can't claim any credit that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. Now, I love Psalm 135, verse 1 and 4. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O you servants of the Lord. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure. Listen, if there's anything that ought to awaken a shout in you, you ought to be shouting already. You ought to be praising God to think just to, uh, in an awe-filled way, meditate on the fact that you are God's treasure. And when we acknowledge his specialness, once again, he reaffirms and acknowledges our specialness. Deuteronomy 26, verses 17 through 19 reveals that. God says, today you have proclaimed the Lord to be your God and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments that you will obey his voice. Now, I pray that you'll do that right now, <clears throat> that you'll walk in his ways, that you'll keep his statutes, that you'll honor his commandments, that you'll cling to his judgments or his discernment of the difference between what is right and wrong. That's God's judgments, not just um, pronouncing judgments on the wicked that brings suffering and destruction. 
his judgments can mean God judging or discerning, distinguishing between what is right, what is wrong, what is good, and what is evil. Okay? And uh, cling to his judgments. Cling to his statutes. Cling to his revelation of what commands he has spoken into your life. And then if you will do that, if you proclaim the Lord to be your God, today the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people. So again, it's a reciprocal relationship. God says, you, you honor me, I honor you. You count my word, something to be revered, respected, to be reverenced, and I will count you something very special in heaven's sight. Just as he promised you that you should keep his commandments and that he will set you on high above all nations which he has made in praise and name and in honor and that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, just as he has spoken. So God emphasizes that he wants a response from us. In fact, Jesus said that in Matthew 10, verse 32, he says, therefore, whosoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. You proclaim me to be special and treasured. I proclaim you to be special and treasured. And then Revelation 3, 5, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and his angels. What an amazing thing. Let's go into the New Testament now. We have focused our attention on the Old Testament. Let's go into the New. But before we do, let me give you one last final thought. So if God has become a treasure in your heart, the Bible says a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. Why would you bring them forth? In order to enrich others. In order to share with them this treasured status. And so the second way you can respond to such an amazing revelation from God that you would be called a special treasure to him. First, your response should be obedience. Second, your response should be praise. Third, your response should be to share it with others. Bring forth this treasure out of your heart to enrich others. Now let's go into the New Testament. 1 Peter 2.9. God refers to you as his own special people. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The Greek word that is translated special there is peripoiesis. Peripoiesis. And it means an acquisition. It means something you obtain, something you uh, purchase to yourself. It's also translated obtain, obtaining, and saving in the Bible. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain, peripoiesis, uh, to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then 2 Thessalonians 2.14 says, To which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining, peripoiesis, the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you're his special people, that means God reached down into this dark planet and seized you and brought you unto himself. You were his acquisition. He acquired you as his possession. Hebrews 10.39 says, We are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul, peripoiesis. Again, it's God rescuing you. Saving you. That's what the word save means. To rescue you from destruction. Seize you, acquire you, and draw you to himself. That same word is translated purchase possession in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 14. Which is incidentally another title for us. We are God's purchase possession. I am God's possession. I belong to God. If I belong to God, he's jealous over me. Paul revealed that in scripture. Now let's read Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. 
We read it in the beginning of the study. In him you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after having believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now remember, I told you what a seal is. It's uh, usually mounted on a necklace or a ring. If it's mounted on a ring, it's called a signet ring. Uh, now you have corporate seals uh, and various types of seals used in the business world, especially in order to authentic uh, authenticate documents to authorize transactions. Well, when God put a seal on you, it imparted an image, just like a seal imparts an image that identifies it to the owner. So when you were sealed by the Holy Spirit, God imparted an image to you. It's the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. You take upon yourself his character, his nature, and it's impressed into you, into your soul, so that you become a changed person. But it's also an authorization, just like a seal on a document authenticates that document and authorizes some kind of transaction to take place. So also when God sealed you, he was authenticating that you are a true son of God and authorizing you to represent him in this world. Praise God. His purchased possession and he put a seal on you to preserve you, to keep you, to guard you keep you from falling, to keep you from being reacquired by the devil. Thank God for that. Therefore, in consideration of these above details, I say in the outline, how do we qualify to be called God's special people? He acquired us as his family. He obtained our fellowship. He saved us. He purchased us, claiming us as his possession by his precious blood. Other translations say we're a people claimed by God for his own uh, the uh, Revised Standard Version says we are God's own people. And what should the end result be? 1 Peter 2.9 says that we might proclaim the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. There's another powerful scripture I need to bring out at this point, and that's Titus 2.14. That says he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, all iniquity. And purify unto himself, purify for himself his own special people. Isn't that something that you were dirty, you were unclean, you were defiled, and you didn't, you could not. You could not have cleansed yourself enough to be a treasure to the almighty God. So God does it for you. He cleanses you and purifies you as his own special people zealous for good works. So there are two reactions in these two scriptures. First Peter 2, 9 says that we're his own special people uh, and that we proclaim the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And now Titus 2, 14 says we're his own special people, but we are zealous for good works. Listen, the zeal of God ought to be burning in your soul. God has been so good to you you really should go out and spread the good news to others. Now, the Greek word translated special people here is uh, periousios, uh, uh, periousios, and that is a word that means beyond usual, beyond usual, beyond ordinary, not your run-of-the-mill person. This is something outrageously unique, a blood-washed saint of the Most High God. Yes, you're special. Praise God. Beyond usual or special. He purified us. He redeemed us, which means he bought us back unto himself. And what should the end result of this be? A people zealous for good works. Now, I want you to imagine for just a moment what the status of Israel, the nation of Israel, would be had they kept the Torah completely. Had they responded to Deuteronomy 19.5 to be God's very special treasure, if they had obeyed his covenant all the way up to the new covenant when the Messiah came, if they had received him and, acclaim, and, and, and claimed him as their Messiah and celebrated him as the incarnation of God, then what kind of condition would the nation of Israel be in today? 
if they had obeyed him from the beginning all the way up through the installation of every covenant that's ever taken place. The Mosaic covenant, the covenant God made with the children of Israel in the wilderness, the covenant God made with uh, David, and now the new covenant, the, which is the eighth covenant. If they had walked in all of those covenants as well as the Abrahamic covenant in the beginning, they would be the chief nation in all the world. You would not have superpowers like the United States of America or Russia or other great and large nations. Israel would be the chief nation in the world and the dominant political power in the world because God would have seen to that. He would have set them on high above all people. And I just wonder, now there's still a reflection of that. The, the, some of the greatest scientists in the world are Jewish, and I believe that's an overflow of the blessing of God that still rests on the seed of Abraham, even prior to them receiving Jesus or Yeshua as their Messiah. But uh, if that's true in the natural, I wonder where the church of the living God would be if the church would walk in complete obedience, if the church would never break covenant, if the church would walk in forgiveness and mercy and love and righteousness and holiness and commitment, and if the church would obey the covenant. You may say, well, we're in the new covenant and it's all about grace and it's all about mercy, and so it's not about commandments. I beg to differ with that. I do believe there's an emphasis of grace and forgiveness in the new covenant that makes restoration much easier, and there's a restorative power flowing through every child of God on a daily basis. We are renewed day by day. The outer man perishes. The inward man is renewed day by day, so it's a fabulous divine installing of restoration power in our lives. However, commandments have not ceased. There are 613 commandments in the Torah, but there are, according to Dake's Bible, 1,050 commandments in the New Testament. So it hasn't decreased, it's increased. And it covers every area of human behavior. What if the church passionately went after those 1,050 commandments, embraced them, fell in love with them. The Messiah, the Bible said in Psalm 45, loved righteousness and hated wickedness. It's one thing to strive to be holy and try to resist sin. It's another thing to fall in love with righteousness and hate wickedness. I challenge you to move up to that level. And what you can be on an individual level and what the church as a whole can be on a corporate level is world impacting. When we realize that we are God's special people and act like it and live like it and reciprocate to God with a lifestyle that is pleasing to him. I urge you to do that. I urge you to do that. I'm gonna go back and read one final scripture that I just find to be very beautiful. And uh, I want to end with this. In him you also trusted, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee, the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. That means final redemption. The day of redemption is the day of resurrection when God will not only redeem your spirit, your soul, but your body will finally be redeemed and shine like the sun in the kingdom of your Father. Until that day, I urge you to harbor Ephesians 4.30 in the harbor of your heart. Go ahead and, 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 and put the anchor down. Let that scripture stay with you on a daily basis. It says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you have been sealed unto the day of redemption. Well, how do you grieve the Holy Spirit of God who has sealed you, sealed you, in, uh, applied the imprint of the seal of God on your life, who has impressed the character of God, the image of God into your soul? How do you grieve the Holy Spirit? By walking opposite to the character of God. Instead of walking in love, walking in hate. Instead of walking in forgiveness, walking in bitterness. 
Instead of walking in yieldedness and surrender, walking in rebellion. Instead of walking in peace, walking in anxiety. Instead of walking in joy, walking in depression. I believe we grieve the Holy Spirit when we resist the seal by walking in something opposite to the image of God that has been imaged in us. Come on, if we are his purchased possession, God's own possession, let it be to the praise of his glory. Let us walk in the character of God, not so that the world will get their eyes on us, but so that others around us will get their eyes on him and realize what a mighty and wonderful and gracious and powerful God he is. Come on, let's pray right now. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for this fantastic revelation that we are a special treasure to God. I have treasured this hour of teaching, Lord, to reveal this truth to your people. And I pray that they will never be the same as a result. They'll uh, wrench themselves free from a self-degrading, self-demeaning, self-condemning attitude of mind and realize there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Free us all, Lord, to walk in the light and to walk in the love of God and realize that you love us with an everlasting love. And when we feel the warmth of that love, we are freed to love others to the same degree. Loving the unlovely, loving the unlovable, loving the unloving of this world. Help us to be like that. Seal us afresh, Lord so that we can be authentic sons and daughters of God, authorized to change the world in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us.